I think that that part of what's happening is that we're starting to come to terms with the power precisely of what I call racial storytelling, right? The stakes around which stories about race and belonging get told or cast aside and the power that that has um, to push forward different kinds of political projects and projects about, you know, um, who should have what kinds of rights in, in a community or in a nation. Um, and this book, Black Legend, is all about the stakes of racial storytelling for individuals, for communities, for nations, right? It's about um, the, the power of who gets to script stories about blackness in a nation's past and present, and the real harm that can come to individuals and entire communities when blackness gets written completely out of a country through racial stories of whiteness and homogeneity. My name is Paulina Alberto, and I'm a professor of history, Spanish, and Portuguese at the University of Michigan. Um, and my new book is Black Legend, The Many Lives of Raul Grijera and the Power of Racial Storytelling in Argentina. Black Legend tells several interwoven stories. At its heart, it's the story of an Afro-Argentine man, Raul Grijera, who rocketed to fame as a black dandy uh, and an icon of Buenos Aires' bohemian nightlife in the early 1900s. Um, he was actually known by the nickname El Negro Raul, or Black Raul, that's how he became famous. Um, and as this kind of character or persona, he appeared in countless newspaper and magazine stories, um, in poems, plays, uh, early tangos, um, and in fact, the first Argentine comic strip, which was called The Adventures of El Negro Raul, was about him, or a fictionalized version of him. Um, he also appeared, he made uh, sort of cameo appearances in early silent films. He was hired as an actor, uh, sort of an extra in, in an early film, and then a figurine of him appeared um, in an early film. Um, so these, these stories about him began to multiply, and Raul Grijera really became um, a rare Afro-Argentine celebrity in early 20th century Buenos Aires, and this is why I call him a Black legend. Um, so a core, sort of the core plot of the book, so to speak, um, is about trying to, to uncover um, and to tell for the first time this, this history of his rise to fame um, as a Black celebrity um, and how this happened really against several odds. Um, so for one thing, Raul um, came from a, a pretty prominent family in, in the um, the Black community in Buenos Aires. He was the son of a well-known um, and a very strict church organist father who um, locked Raul up in a reformatory when he was um, a young man, in part because he was seen as sort of disobedient and rowdy and prone to, to partying. Um, Raul then went on to have several encounters with the police as soon as he got out of the reform school. Um, mainly due to gambling and dodging the draft. Um, and he narrowly avoided a jail sentence. Um, and still, despite all of these uh, sort of bumpy starts, he achieved this, this real feat of making himself into um, really, like I said, an icon of the city's nightlife and especially of the emerging Argentine tango. Um, and what's even more remarkable is that he did so, he achieved this kind of tightrope walk of fame as a black man, a very visibly black man, in a city that increasingly celebrated its own homogenous whiteness, declared black people to have disappeared, and in fact was extremely hostile to people of African descent um, when, when they were um, sort of in prominent spaces. Um, and so that story, the story of Raul's fame um, and sort of self-making as what he called um, el murciélago or the bat, this kind of creature of the night, uh, that's the core story of the book. And that's what's reflected in the, the photo of Raul from around 1910 that is on the cover. But the book also tells um, 
at least two other stories. The second one is the story of how and why Raul's fame ended up being short-lived um, and ultimately why he was forgotten. Um, because shortly after he rose to fame, in fact, by the mid 1910s, um, and then sort of with increasing frequency thereafter, um, the city's storytellers, so the people who had the power to shape print culture, you know, theater, music, and other parts of popular culture, began to tell um, really defamatory stories about Raul. Um, and this made his fame sort of degrade into infamy. So he sort of fell from, from, from grace. And so a second layer of the book explores the power of these stories, stories that were extremely racialized to make his public persona and really to um, derail, in a sense, the course of his life. Um, and these stories were not random. In fact, like I said, they were racial stories. And they were stories about him and his character, but they actually mapped very neatly onto broader narratives about the supposed disappearance of Black people from Argentina. And this was a process um, that was understood to have begun in the 19th century and to have been consummated by the turn of the 20th. And so it was said that uh, Black people had died in, in wars, um, through disease and pestilence, and ultimately had been sort of diluted out of the population through the mass immigration of white Europeans in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so I call this, this is the second meaning of Black legend. I call this kind of the Black legend of Afro-Argentine history. Um, and what I mean to do here is to echo a particular narrative um, which was the, the famous Black legend of the Spanish conquest of the New World, um, which emphasized the genocidal effects of European conquest in the New World, but also greatly exaggerated them, making it seem also almost as if indigenous people had completely disappeared in the New World. And so similarly, this Black legend of, of Afro-Argentine disappearance can be used to celebrate Argentina's whiteness or to lament the violence that led to the sort of um, whitening of the population, but it always ends up exaggerating the extent to which um, African descended people sort of disappeared from, from Argentina. Um, and so uh, these these racial stories about Raul actually mapped onto these broader stories by presenting him as the last Afro-Argentine. He was sort of a man who was, um, you know, left over from another historical era. Um, and at the same time, they dismissed him as deeply, not just out of time, but out of place. He had no place in a modern Argentina. He was a simulator. He was a pathetic buffoon, um, a madman, a social parasite, um, essentially a person with no business living in, in a modern white nation. And so the second story that the book is trying to tell is about these stories and the kinds of effects that they had on Raul and on other Afro-Argentines at the time. So what was it like for the historical man, Raul Rijera, to live his life in constant sort of negotiation and dialogue with these stories about his character, which were demeaning and um, racist and often dehumanizing, um, and then I think about that process more broadly, which is that just as just in the same way that there were stories told about him specifically racial stories, there were other stories told about black people in general in Argentina, racial stories. Um, and I try to understand what it might have been like for Raul's contemporaries or his family members to have lived in constant negotiation with those kinds of narratives and stories um, at different times in Argentine history. Now, to be clear, Afro-Argentines had not disappeared from Argentina, um, and Raúl Rijera was by no means the last Afro-Argentine. Um, in fact, Raúl was born in the 1880s um, into a large and prominent Afro-Argentine family. Um, he was born into a very lively Black neighborhood in central Buenos Aires, um, and he and his family were part of uh, again, a vibrant Black community with, um, with a really strong associational life, uh, with 
community dances, with carnival bands, um, and with their own newspapers, their own press. Uh, so this community did not sort of disappear from one day to the next. What happened, and in fact, this happened in the first decades of Raul's life as a young man, um, was that this community became, through a combination of force and choice, sort of statistically invisible. So over the course of the 19th century, the Argentine state embraced ideas of uh, liberalism and universalism and colorlessness, sort of universal citizenship without regard to race. Um, and they began to remove many, though not all, um, racial labels from official statistics. So famously, the national census, for instance, stopped counting people according to race. Um, and so in part, this was a process imposed from above. At the same time, many Afro-descendant people in Buenos Aires really embraced this idea of citizenship without regard to race. And in fact, it was something that um, many uh, black soldiers had fought for in the wars of independence to be able to get rid of the hated caste system that had labeled people primarily according to their, to their color um, and standing. And so um, initially this, this sort of had, there was hope that this could have some kind of liberatory or inclusionary um, effect this kind of silencing of race. But as the 19th century progressed uh, and the Argentine state began to um, court and receive millions of European immigrants in earnest, alongside the rise of ideas of scientific racism and white supremacy, um, Argentine leaders increasingly embraced and um, disseminated the notion that the country was uh, becoming homogeneously white, and that this, of course, was a good thing. Um, and so in this context, especially by 1910, um, a context of sort of marked white supremacy and anti-Blackness, um, Argentine leaders really found value in declaring the Black population that had once existed to have completely disappeared. So Raul really came of age just as this disappearance was um, being decreed as uh, sort of a consummated fact. And in fact, he became a black celebrity precisely when Buenos Aires was sort of portraying itself as the Paris of Latin America um, and, and showing itself to be an unusually Europeanized space in Latin America. So the myth of Argentina as, as a white nation, which was taking root um, around the turn of the 20th century, was, was sustained in a range of stories from national literature to art to statues um, to works of history. And so people of African descent did not disappear, but by and large, they ceased to be able to identify publicly as people of African descent because those racial categories did not disappear, or uh, sorry, did, were no longer available to them, or they chose not to because of the extremely hostile um, responses because of the, 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 the the racist treatment that they and the abuse that they that they received. Um, so these racial stories or narratives of homogenous whiteness really made it impossible in many ways to be both black and Argentine. Um, and this is what I mean when in the subtitle of the book, I talk about the power of racial storytelling in Argentina. And this is the this is the the context in which Raul managed briefly to become famous, but later to sort of pay the price for that fame. Um, and then the book tells one last story, and it's a story really, it's my story as a historian, it's the story I'm putting forth with the book, which is a story of Black presence um, and Black creativity um, that I hope will displace these existing stories about Black absence and Black degradation. Um, Black legend is really the first history of Black Argentina um, and of Argentine Blackness that is told across three centuries of national life, so from the 19th to the 21st. Um, and this has been really hard to do, especially because the 20th century is a time when um, this statistical invisibility is, is a real obstacle to doing archival research. It's hard to find people in the archives who you can identify as being a person of African descent. Um, but focusing on Raul, who was a known person of African descent, allowed me to sort of work backwards in time and also forwards in time 
um, and to center his family, his community, um, and really other groups of Afro-Argentines across five generations of Argentine history. So the book ends up being not just about him, but sort of part of a broader story of how Afro-Argentine individuals, really from the early 19th century to the present, um, negotiated slavery, freedom, um, lived experiences of blackness together with narratives of blackness, and really the efforts to achieve full belonging in a nation that was increasingly defined as white. Most immediately, um, what inspired me to write Black Legend was meeting Raul in the archives. Um, I had long wanted to write a book about Afro-Argentines in the 20th century, um, but for the reasons I just mentioned, this was not an easy task, um, and I was dissuaded by colleagues and friends who um, not unreasonably tried to tell me, hey, you know, you're not going to find much. It probably can't be done. Um, and one day I thought I'd start with one of the few places in Argentina's National Archives that does have information about the 20th century, um, and that's its photographic collection. And so I was going through the photographic collections and I found photos of this man named Raul Grijera, AKA El Negro Raul. That's all they said on the back. Um, and I was immediately drawn in because he was clearly a 20th century figure um, the studio photo of him that appears on the cover was especially arresting. Um, you know, he's a young man. Uh, he looks very handsome. He's wearing um, these coattails and a fancy little uh, shallow straw hat and a, and a cane. Later photos of him as an older man, though, showed a kind of a stark transformation. They showed him um, wandering the city, sort of sleeping in doorways. Um, dressed in rags, impoverished, it seemed like he was perhaps homeless. And yet a later uh, set of photos showed uh, a, a really elderly man at some sort of institution being flanked by men in, in white coats. So, you know, this was enough to really spark my, my curiosity. Um, and I tried to find out as much as I, as I could from the photos and all I could figure out was that he had been extremely famous but I couldn't figure out why. So I started digging up some of the, these stories that were told about him, very few at first, and then increasingly more came tumbling forth. And, and these were mostly fictional or semi-fictional accounts of El Negro Raul um, in popular print culture, but there was often just enough of a little tidbit of historical sort of accuracy in some of these sources to, to point me to other sources, um, archival sources, um, institutional sources. And as I started to track down these sources outside of the, of the kind of corpus of stories that were told about him, it started to dawn on me that it would be possible not just to write a book about Argentine ideas of blackness as refracted through this character in these semi-fictional stories, which is what I thought I was gonna originally be able to do, but that I might actually be able to reconstruct this man's life, the historical perfect life, as well as perhaps the lives of his relatives and some of his community members. So for example, the kinds of sources outside of the racial stories that I'm talking about that, that allowed this to be a book about a man and not just a, a character, include, for instance, the many legal documents in Argentina's National Archive um, from the 19th century that allowed me to trace the history of the house in which Raul was born. Um, and this is a history that is fascinating in its own right. It's a history that reaches back to the late 18th century and that encompasses the remarkable lives of Raul's female ancestors. So his great-great-grandmother, his great-grandmother, and his grandmother, as they sort of negotiated their way toward freedom from, from different degrees of enslavement. I also found continual references to Raul's grandparents and parents in um, the late 19th century Black press of Buenos Aires. So this was an amazing connection for me. I had long been reading the, the Black press and, and thinking about it as a, 
as a source for sort of intellectual and social history, but I never thought I would find the actual relatives of the person I was writing about in this kind of sort of biographical way. And this allowed me to, to sort of reconstruct Raul's family's life in that house, but it also pointed toward that family's connections with the broader community. Um, as earlier, I discovered through a, a, a kind of small clue in an interview that he gave, that Raul himself gave to a, a journalist late in his life, that he had been locked up in this reformatory by his father. And locked up are his words. He obviously felt it as a clear deprivation of liberty. And so I was able to go to that reformatory, which is still functioning today. Um, and I was lucky enough to find his file, even though the archives had never been opened to, to any researchers before. Um, I found his police records, uh, which sort of told of repeated encounters with the police um, over decades. Um, and these not only helped me to understand the ways that he was being envisioned as a sort of racialized and criminalized subject by the police, but it also allowed me to sort of get a sense of Raul's movements through the city um, for years in which other documents were scarce. Um, uh, and finally, against all predictions, <laughs> I was able to find his file at the mental institution in which he spent the last decade plus of his life and in which he finally died. Um, and this allowed me to, to, to sort of get a sense of how the doctors and psychiatrists who cared for him there or actually did him there um, engaged in their own forms of racial storytelling as they tried to make sense of, of, this, of this famous patient that they had. Um, so all of this changed my idea of the kind of book that I could write and really challenged me to think about and to find a new way to narrate how Raul's life unfolded in dialogue with these stories about him specifically and about Black people more broadly. In terms of contemporary debates around race, um, I think, uh, of course, we're in a moment right now where the United States, after the events of the summer of 2020, is has sort of uh, is grappling with, with questions of race in a much more direct way. Um, I think there's also a growing awareness in the United States and public life about the power of story and narrative, the power that they have to shape beliefs. And this is something that scholars call narrative impact or narrative persuasion. Um, and so, you know, Everyone from economists to sociologists to spiritual leaders um, tell us that the key to finding happiness uh, lies in the stories we tell ourselves, for example. So this, there's this awareness of the power of story. Um, and I think that these two things together, greater attention to issues of race and racial justice, um, and greater attention to the power of narrative and narrative persuasion helps explain why these attempts to retell U.S. history with slavery and racism at their center, for example, or most notably the, the, the 1619 Project, um, have sparked so much attention, both from admirers and from critics, right? Um, and one of the things that detractors of the 1619 Project do is to try to conflate it with critical race theory. Um, but, you know, despite the kind of bogeyman qualities that they assign to theory, it's, it's not the theory behind the 1619 Project that makes it powerful, but it's the gripping storytelling. I think it's really um, the, the powerful stories that it's bringing to readers, to U.S. classrooms um, that make it so resonant with U.S. audiences and that also make it so threatening to conservatives. Um, so I, I think that that part of what's happening is that we're starting to come to terms with the power precisely of what I call racial storytelling, right? The stakes around which stories about race and belonging get told or cast aside and the power that that has um, to push forward different kinds of political projects and projects about, you know, um, 
who should have what kinds of rights in, in a community or in a nation. Um, and this book, Black Legend, is all about the stakes of racial storytelling for individuals, for communities, for nations, right? It's about um, the, the power of who gets to script stories about blackness in a nation's past and present, and the real harm that can come to individuals and entire communities when blackness gets written completely out of a country through racial stories of whiteness and homogeneity. Black Legend is for people interested in Black lives and experiences across the Americas. Um, also because Raul's family was a family of musicians and he himself was a, a dancer and an icon of the Argentine tango, um, this book is also for lovers of music and dance. Um, and even more broadly, uh, I think this book is for people who love stories but who also recognize the power of stories in the world um, for good or for ill. Uh, and, and the book works as a bit of a detective novel um, in which, in addition to telling the stories about Raul and about Argentina's racial narratives, um, I also relate my own process of discovery as I follow Raul's traces through archives, institutions, and documents. The, the controversy surrounding casting in the recent movie In the Heights uh, sparked widespread conversations um, about how people of African descent are often excluded from or rendered invisible within or marginalized within Latinx communities here in the US. Um, and I think one of the things that US readers can take away from this book um, is to see how that dynamic uh, actually has a deep history in Latin America itself, um, where Afro-Latin Americans have long been erased or marginalized in their nation's official histories, um, cultural productions, and sort of dominant narratives of nationhood. Um, and this is despite the fact that the Spanish and Portuguese territories that became Latin America received almost two thirds of all the captive Africans brought to the new world um, as enslaved people. Uh, and although these processes of invisibilization occurred across Latin America, uh, I think Argentina stands as the starkest example um, of, of, this, of this process because it was one of the few societies um, along with Uruguay and Chile perhaps that successfully constructed themselves um, as exceptionally white and Europeanized societies because of um, European immigration in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And for decades now, activists, uh, Afro-descendant activists and, uh, and academics have been debunking this um, opinion that Argentina is a white nation. It, it, it remains a tenacious narrative, but they've been fighting it. Um, Black legend really uh, helps to push that agenda forward by centering Black people and Blackness in Argentina's modern history. Uh, and, and not just because it, it tries to tell the story of Blackness across three centuries so that it's, it's a continuous story of presence, but also because Raul's story is, um, is powerful precisely because his history cuts across wide swaths of the Argentine experience. Um, so he's not just uh, speaking to the history of, of, of a small black community. He is actually, you know, um, moving through life in a way uh, that forces me as the historian to link his history to histories of mass politics and class formation histories of um, Afro-Argentine music like candombe and milonga or the tango, uh, to the arts, theater, literature. Um, it's a story that, that cuts across histories of enslaved and free labor uh, to histories of policing and mental institutions, 
um, from histories of the law to histories of sexuality. So his story really makes it impossible to deny that blackness mattered deeply in 20th century Argentina. Um, you know, until, until recently, um, many uh, Argentine academics, with the exception of the small group of people who, who work on histories of, of race and blackness, have sort of thought that this was kind of a niche uh, story, right? A, a sort of a niche area of Argentine history. But I think Raul's story really puts that, that claim to bed. Um, and Black Legend shows more forcefully than has been possible, I think, until now, that Blackness, far from disappearing from society in the 20th century, continued to be recognized as a real social dynamic um, throughout the 20th century. And it also demonstrates beyond a doubt that anti-Blackness continued to exist very strongly throughout the 20th century. And that anti-Black racism really provided the condition of possibility for other forms of marking difference in society um, that are still very much present today. Uh, so I think all of those dynamics are really important in Argentine history, um, but, but speak more broadly to the problem of Black invisibility in other uh, American societies as well. Yes, well, number one, for many people who are not familiar with Afro-Latin American studies, um, it might come as a surprise that Argentina had such a large Black population um, in the late colonial and early national periods. It, this was a population um, that accounted for up to 50% of the population of some area in Argentina's Northwest, um, around 30% of the population in the city of Buenos Aires, the capital. Um, was Afro-descendant until the early 19th century. Um, but even for many specialists, I think it'll be surprising to hear that it is possible to tell this detailed a history about an Afro-Argentine person um, and a broader Afro-Argentine community um, that spans this transition from the 19th and into the 20th century. More broadly, I think another thing that will surprise people is the evidence that Black legend provides of the harmful power of stories. Um, so we know, thanks to research across the social, the social sciences, um, that the words that we use to describe people, groups of people, right, the stereotypes or the stories that we construct about them have the power to negatively shape uh, people's life trajectories, their outcomes, um, at an individual and community level. Uh, but Black Legend, by reconstructing the relationship between the historical Raul Rijera and the fictional representations of him through racial stories, really offers the first case study of how these racial stories can impact the life of one individual. Um, and it illustrates with really painful clarity, I think, how these stories about one black man, stories that are themselves linked to narratives about black people in Argentina and in the Americas more broadly, could turn this man's fortunes from fame to infamy. Um, so the book shows how the racial stories that dismissed him as a pathetic buffoon or as a social parasite um, actually helped bring about his final decades of homelessness, poverty, illness, and confinement to the mental institution where he finally died, um, in part because of the ways in which they shaped the expectations of the many authorities, right, scientific, legal, um, police authorities, and so forth, who encountered him at every turn and who thought that they knew something about this man simply by looking at him um, and inferring things about him based on his appearance. 
this is a book about Argentina, and I recognize that it's a place sort of on the farthest margins of the African diaspora. Um, but it has a really important story to tell about the nature of black celebrity and the power of racial storytelling. And so I hope readers here in the US uh, will find this book to be both resonant and useful to the cause of um, racial and social justice um, and to the goal of rewriting the history and racial narratives of this and other countries um, that are still wrestling with the afterlives of slavery.